Well, I am delighted to say that joining me on the Godcast today is Mark Williams Thomas. Now, Mark uh, was born in Billericay and he was educated at Amesbury School and there, Pierre Point. Uh, but in 1989, he joined uh, the Surrey Police. During his time with the Surrey Police, he was a specialist in major crime and child abuse and he left in the year 2000. Mark is probably best known for exposing Jimmy Savile as a paedophile in the other side of Jimmy Savile. Uh, this is a television documentary that Mark presented. And also uh, in 2014, uh, Mark covered the verdict of Oscar Pistorius and was actually the only British journalist to meet with Pistorius during his trial. And now of course he works in media, uh, exclusive report writer, um, and uh, UK national newspapers as well. Mark, a very warm welcome to the Godcast. How are you today? Yeah, very good. Thank you. And thank you very much for having me on. No, it's wonderful. I'm absolutely delighted. I've got some great questions lined up, hopefully. And um, whereabouts in the world are you, Mark? Perhaps best not to give you a postcode, but uh, whereabouts yeah. are you? So I'm in Surrey. Okay. All right. Oh, so my brother was, uh, my brother lived in Farnham in Surrey, actually. So. Okay. Yeah, I know Farnham very well. I grew up uh, not far from Farnham. In fact, Pierpoint School is in Frensham, which is just outside Farnham. So my youth was very much spent around the Farnham area and in the pubs in Farnham. Okay, fair enough. And um, and uh, growing up, uh, was that was that a pleasurable, uh, good time of your life? You got fond memories of being a child? Yeah, I do. I don't. I don't think I have that many memories. Uh, my latter years, and certainly growing up, I did. When I was at Pierpoint uh, playing sport, I used to love that, and and that was a, a good time. But yeah, I moved around a bit. My my dad say was a GP, so he had a practice initially in Solihull in the West Midlands. Yeah. Then we moved from Solihull to Surrey and lived in Surrey until I moved to Guildford when I joined the police. And yeah, I, I, I enjoyed school. I think I struggled. I struggled massively in my early parts of school because it was academia is not where I come from. No. You know, I'd much prefer to be out in the playing field running around uh, and being sporty. And yeah. obviously I've continued that through. But and when I eventually did actually get a master's, I was incredibly proud because I thought I'd never go to university and never achieve that. Well, that's great. Well, that's something we have in common. I, I'm not academic at all, and and I ended up with a degree. I haven't got a master's, but but the feeling, you know, there's a sense of pride, isn't there, when you're not? Yeah. 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 And I, you know, I've got a dyslexia. I'm very open about it. I write about it in my book. I've got dyslexia quite badly, and and I struggle. I hugely struggle in terms of writing stuff, but. I've had a lot of help along the way. My dad's been amazing. He's a proofreader for me. I've got a, a PA who does all my proofreading now. And that just enables me to be able to write for newspapers and do the scripts and things. And, and I think when you get into a pattern and writing in a certain way, it's much easier. When you yeah. sit down to write an, an essay or a, a story which isn't in a formatted way, like we write for newspapers, it's it's a lot more challenging, and I struggle with that. Yeah, and um, um, it's a it is the Godcast, so we have to get some faith in there along the way. Was there was there any uh, church connections? Were you in the Cubs or the Scouts or Sunday school? As yeah, well? so I was in the Cubs. I was in the Cubs. I a short period of time in the Scouts. Very much involved in when I was in school in CCF. Um, the combined cadet force and and I certainly my school was a very French and uh, Pierpoint in French was quite a religious school mm. uh, and certainly Amesbury I mean Amesbury was an amazing school we had our own little church and so up until the age of 13 we would have church services twice a week uh, it was a it was an amazing school it's got a fantastic history to that Lord Mountbatten uh, moved from it was a school that was basically lifted up from London and brought down to to Surrey yeah. uh, and and so yes yeah, so particularly you know I think religion has formed a, a part of my life for a lot a lot my, my parents I wouldn't say my parents are overly religious but we go to church you know every now and then we certainly mm -hmm. Christmas and the important occasions we celebrate and I think that there is always a thought that that faith exists in my life yeah. Do you still do you still do church at Christmas or? or yeah, or definitely okay. church at Christmas. You know, we yeah. used to put the kids. We used to do the Christingle service, which was a was a, which is really popular. Yeah. And I think the, the church has had to modernise uh, 
because I think it was stuck in the past and I think it really struggled. But I think it's it's modernization has really caught the young generation. And I think it's in a way it's pretty healthy. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think the, the problem with the church is it went through a stage of obviously a lot of scandal. And and I was involved in a covering of that. You know, I've arrested a lot of people who have been involved in church either through voluntary or through vicars. I did a huge yeah. review for a number of churches in terms of, of their reviews when they went through that process. So I have got a lot of contacts within the church yeah. and people that I speak to. Um, but it's like any big organization. It's a, it's a, it's a colossal um, vehicle, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, if we have time, we'll perhaps come back to that. But um, yeah. Mark, for now, can I ask... Uh, where did the idea of being a policeman come from? Was it was it something you grew up wanting to be or did it come later? When was that? So I was in school and I had the opportunity to go and play rugby in New Zealand. I played rugby okay. at quite a high standard. I had the opportunity to go and play there. And at the same time, I thought, actually, I want to also get a job. And I knew that academia was always going to be a problem for me. I'd love to become a vet, but there was no way that I could have gone to university and studied. I love animals. Actually, I love animals more than people. And, and as a result of that, I thought, what else could I do that gives me the enjoyment of being outside, but also hugely rewarding? And, yeah. and I, help, I love helping people. And I thought, you know, let's give, it, let's give the police service a go. I didn't know anybody in the police service, but I've heard, a, a, obviously, you see it all the time. And I thought it's a very active job, and I'm a very active person. So I applied, uh, I applied for two forces. I applied for Hampshire and Surrey, the same time as I had an offer to go and play rugby in New Zealand. And both forces came back to me and said, you can't apply for two forces, you have to apply for one. Right. So I chose Surrey. I thought, okay, well, I'll go for Surrey. And Surrey came back and gave me an offer and went for the board and went through. And then they said, you know, we'll give you this offer to start. And then I had to make a call. I thought, do I join the police service or do I go and play rugby in New Zealand? Mm -hmm. And I chose to join the police service. And actually, it's a big lesson that I've carried forward in the rest of my life is it in terms of regrets, it is the only regret that I clearly have, because I'd love to have gone and done that and joined the police a year later or two years later. And then maybe I wouldn't have done. Maybe my life would have changed. Um, so I always think to myself, I never want to live life with regrets. No. You have to take those opportunities that, that you get faced with and, and make the most of them. Yeah. And I joined the police service and I never looked back. You know, my time in the police service was incredibly rewarding. I loved it. There's some, I mean, the police service now is very different to what it was, but I've seen the worst in things. Mm. You know, I, this idea of believing the unbelievable is absolutely true. Yeah. When you, when you signed up, Mark, was your intentions on, on um, a long-term career or were you just uh, initially just satisfied to be a Bobby on the beat? No, no, I always had aspirations to, to develop and go further. I mean, I, initially, I wanted to be a traffic officer. I, you know, this idea of driving around fast in cars, and that's probably about my age as much as anything else. So, you know, I was 18 years old, 19 years old, and, and I wanted the idea of driving around in a, in a nice brand new car as fast as possible with, with blue lights and sirens going. But you quickly settle into it and realise, yeah, that's actually probably not for me. And then I got a, a huge interest in working with vulnerable people, particularly through the uh, safeguarding element. There's a new safeguarding uh, team brought in within Surrey Police. And that's where I found my interest. And then I subsequently moved into child protection, then moved into becoming a detective. And my focus was, was almost entirely around safeguarding, child protection, and then subsequently moving into murder investigations. And, and I love investigating. I love finding stuff out and there's a huge highs and huge lows you know when you are investigating a major crime the highs when you catch your offender when you get the little breakthrough that, that mm -hmm. enables you to get the case solved is yeah. massive but the lows are also huge and, and I find the same in the work I do now you know the media and the work I do now is is very similar to it but the highs and the lows are is, is exactly the same yeah and then, you, and then you left the police force in, was it 2011 that you left the police force? What, what prompted that? Was it, was it just time or? Yeah, and then two, 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 after 2000, 2001, I'd got to a position, I dealt with a lot of really big cases and, and I'd been called out almost every weekend. I was on murder investigations, running three or four at a time. And 
work was quite intense. So I'd be playing rugby at weekend and I'd get a, a, my pager would go off or my pager would go off in the early hours of the morning. So it does become more than just a, a, a job. It's a way of life. Mm. And, and I thought, do you know what? I don't know if I can continue to do this for the rest of my life. And then I dealt with a really big job. I was an air traffic controller who'd been sexually abusing children for a very long time. And his, his list of victims were, was well in excess of 40 victims, 40, 50 victims. It was a huge investigation. And I kind of ended up dealing with it on my own. I remember saying to my detective inspector, look, I need some help on this. This is just a massive job. And he said, well, I can give you you know, one, one officer to help you just for a short period of time. And they were brilliant and they helped, enabled us to get in you know, to court and to, uh, to trial. But then after that, I thought, you know what, this is, this is a pretty lonely life. And, yeah. and I, when I start off on something, whatever you put in my path, I'll, I will get, I'll find a way around it and make it happen. You know, I'm a pretty gutsy, determined person. I was determined to get justice for these people, but it meant that I, I mean, at one stage, I only had a weekend for about, I don't know, for about two, three months. It was just constant work. Well, and you, I said afterwards, this is just going to burn me out. I cannot yeah. keep doing this. You, you just said that, that you were dealing with it, but you, you're not just dealing with the crime, are you? You, you are dealing with the mental impact that that has on you. And, you know, you can perhaps help me and, and other people in this COVID situation because I, I kind of look at it in times and seasons. And we're definitely in a season, our church, of um, difficulty. You know, we've, we've got a food bank going. It's very traumatic. Some of the people that we meet and the people we see mm. and they're, circumstances is profoundly upsetting um and you do sometimes feel like oh, i'm dealing with this as well as everything else what yeah. was your coping strategy for that kind of stuff you know you're dealing with a, a dreadful uh, case of abuse or murder how did you shut down or did you not so uh, you're absolutely right because you whilst you deal with one element which is of course the offender and those aspects but you're dealing with people's emotions you're dealing with people in the worst time of their life when you suddenly go into a family and their child has just been murdered or they've just found out their child is dead they want answers so have to deal with the grief and that's, that's sitting with them and you become the funnel for that in terms of how they offload and i will say to people and i still say it now is that you know i i'm my shoulders are broad i'll take this responsibility offload to me and and i'll help you through this and I think a lot of it is not just having a coping mechanism yourself, but it's about enabling them to have a coping mechanism because they're in a world that they've never been in before. When you are suddenly landed in a world where a loved one has died or been murdered, you are not only facing the reality of losing somebody, but it's the administrative element. So I'm sure you find this. You know, the whole process of how do I, what do I do in terms of organizing their, their estate? What do I do in terms of the funeral? What do I do in terms of telling people? How, all of those administrative stuff, which people don't end up having to deal with until somebody dies. And then on top of that, you have all the relatives and the people that suddenly come out of the woodwork and those people that want to become involved in that whole situation. So throw that all in, and then you've got your own personal response to that. How is that affecting me? Because I've always said, you know, I've dealt with some of the worst possible offences. And if I relate it to, for example, indecent photographs of children, you know, I always said, and, and people, some people say, oh, you know, it's fine, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect me, it doesn't upset me. Every image of a child abuse upsets me, it affects me. But what I do is I turn it into a passion, a desire to catch the offender, to help that young child. Yeah. The moment I... I don't get affected by that. It's the moment to walk away because of course it affects you and it affects me all the time. What I have to do and I'm very good at and in a way probably I've struggled more recently but in the days when I was doing that I was very good at compartmentalizing. I was very good at saying you know this is work and away from work I have to have my releases. But my releases were rugby, motorbikes, and gardening, you know, those, and my family, you know, those were my releases. And I think as you get older, the complexities of the issues that you have to deal with become greater because you take on more responsibility. There's more issues that you have to deal with. And I think COVID is one of those because as we get older, we become less invincible. As we are in our 20s and 30s, 
we don't think things hurt us. No. We don't think things can get us. But now when we're 40, 50, 60, we realize that they do. We realize that our parents are vulnerable. Yeah. We realize we have to support them. And I think our whole mindset changes. And as a result of that, that is an impact on us because we take on those responsibilities. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mark. It's uh, wise words. And so if we move on, uh, so you left the, the police, for, police force and you kind of move into the world of television. How did those circumstances come about for you? Did, were you were you searching for that or were people inquiring and, and making noises? No, it's a strange one. I mean, people have written about it and said, oh, you know, he always wanted to become a, you know, a presenter, a, a face of television. And that's absolutely not the true. You know, when I was in the police service, I did do a number of police programmes, interviews, but because of the cases I was dealing with, when I left the police service, I went to work for a, a, an organisation which was a, a former um, England rugby player who was a multimillionaire, and he said, come and learn a bit of business with me. And I thought, oh, fantastic. And I did that for a while. And then I moved into television and I, I got a break. I got a, two lucky breaks. My first lucky break was I applied for a job to be a police advisor on crime dramas. And, and I got it. And I remember coming back home after being just being given the job, sitting at a dining room table and going, I, am I up for this? I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I quickly thought, actually, do you know what? I can do this. It was only a momentary thought. Mm. And then I subsequently went on and, and was the police advisor for nearly every crime drama at that period of time. I spent six years advising on um, The Waking Dead, which was a, an amazing program. And I loved all of those Inspector Lee's right. Mysteries. Um, so I loved them and I did them. And then, and then I had a really lucky break in terms of telly. I was going to, I was doing some work with ITV and I said, look, there's this actually uh, app. So I was, there's this priest in Germany who was grooming a young child in Wales. And we'd got a covert uh, officer talking to him. And we said, look, let's go over and confront him and let's go and get the German authorities to prosecute, to arrest him and investigate him. And then we'll go and confront him. Uh, and the, the great power that I have is when I go over and speak to foreign police forces, because of my background in policing, they listen to you. So I went over there, we got the German authorities to go and interview him, we went and confronted him. And, and off the back of that, the reporter who was meant to be coming out to do it couldn't get there in time before, in order for us to confront him. So I did the confront and then after that, the editor said to me, we can't really get him in the programme now, it's you, you'll have to front the programme. And that was my lucky break. And then wow. since then, obviously, I've made you know, lots and lots of programmes, have had some amazing results in terms of Savile uh, and, and obviously a number of other people who I've been instrumental in getting arrested and going to jail. Mark, when um, Jimmy Savile, I remember, I remember when the story broke, I was, uh, I was working for Argos, I was a manager for Argos and I was at a manager's meeting and it went, the, the story broke and the room was divided. Some were surprised and absolutely no way could Jimmy Savile do this. There's no way. How, how soon before the story broke did you know that he was, he was up to no good? And was there, was, there, was there lots of noise about him before the story broke? So we'd been working on it for about a year. Uh, prior, about a year prior to the story breaking into the news, I'd been to, I went over to uh, Interpol to do a piece on the uh, Interpol police. And on the way back, my BBC producer, who was, I was at the time working for BBC Newsnight, said to me, have you ever heard anything about Jimmy Savile being a sex offender? I said, no, he's a complete weirdo, but I've never heard anything. No. That was really the start of it. We subsequently picked the story up when BBC Newsnight culled it and said they're not going to run with it. There was still an awful lot of work to do. It was far from a piece where you could put out. And for the next 12 months, we set out to investigate it. I didn't get paid for that 12 months at the time. And, and literally I went out, I spoke to people, I phoned them up, um, created a, an off record uh, file on it. I said to my producer at ITV, we're not putting anything in this on the ITV system. We didn't want anyone to get a heads up on it, what was going on. And then as a result of that, we subsequently, uh, went back to ITV and said that we've now got this number of victims and slowly we built a case it went into the public domain 
I do remember there were I mean, some significant moments. There was a moment when BBC Radio Leeds, prior to the story, or prior to the programme running, but the story going out that we were making a programme, did a you know half an hour, an hour in, uh, radio phone in where they were basically criticising me, saying, you know, how dare this guy think that he can say these things about this guy who can't defend himself. And I remember listening to it and felt quite hurt by it all, but realising actually somebody may phone up with a significant piece of information. They didn't, I listened to that. And then there was another moment when, when his, um, he did an auction of all his items, because of course at this stage he died. And I remember listening to it, it was an online auction that was uh, over the internet. And I remember listening to it and thinking to myself, little do people know that in less than six months, all of this is gonna be worth nothing. And people have paid tens of, of thousands of pounds for some of his items. Uh, and I think that's often the way. I think as a police officer, one of the things, when I handed back my warrant card, I felt a great lifting of power and responsibility going. And, and why that's really important is that as a police officer, I think not enough police officers understand the impact that you can have on someone's life. You can change someone's life overnight. And that was a, it wasn't a burden, but it was a huge responsibility I felt. And when I lifted and gave that card back, it was almost a position of going, Do you know what, now I don't have the same levels of responsibility. I would still respond and deal with things if I saw things. But we see things and we're involved in things that, that change people's lives. And even now, I'll, get, I'll be aware of information that tomorrow is going to completely and utterly change not just a person's life, but a person's family's life. Yeah. And I think that's a huge responsibility. And it is a responsibility that I don't think necessarily we take, take uh, police officers uh, uh, take enough detail of because people's lives change. And, and when we've got the power to change people's lives, that's a huge responsibility. Yeah. Mark, can I ask how, if, if people had, had come forward sooner with information regarding Jimmy Savile, how much sooner could he have been stopped? Well, I, I think I think the, my, my question in here is is that we we've had in the Church of England uh, there was the Peter Ball case, yeah. and I'm appalled at the amount of cover up that went on in that investigation. Yeah. You know, people that kind of turned a blind eye, refused to speak, refused to yeah. push somebody into the limelight and make them be accountable for something they've done. So that's where my question comes from, I suppose. H how sooner? So were there people within organisations, not just the BBC, but within other organisations who knew that Jimmy Savile should not have been around children, was a risk to children? Absolutely. Were there people that could have done something to stop it? Absolutely. But was it of any interest to some of those people to do it? No. Was it the author were the authorities minded to go down that route? No. So it made things very difficult but there were definitely people who could have taken a stance and tried to get the authorities to do something, whether they would or wouldn't. I mean, the authorities had information over the years that they ignored, that they didn't act upon. And even when they did have a huge chance, sorry, police had a huge chance when they had allegations made to them, they got it completely wrong. They failed massively. Uh, so, and I, and I think one of these things that, that happens within organizations, within the church, and I can talk, very clearly about the church, because I've investigated the church, I've done huge reviews within the church, is it is no different to any other organizations, big organizations, is by and large, the first view of those people who run those organizations is self-protection. It is about protecting the organization itself. It's secondary, the impact that it has on the victims around that. That is not their first, first cause for concern because Sadly, it is all financially driven. You know, everything has a value. Everything has a, com every, everything becomes a commodity, it's a value. And therefore, as a result of that, what is it that we stand to lose if we stand up and say, we got it wrong, we failed, we did these things. And that's why the BBC turned on itself. We can see some of the issues now in terms of Bashir and what's going on in respect to the BBC in regards to that. This is the massive problem that occurs 
rather than stand up and say, and I do, I think I give a number of organizations advice in terms of how to manage the media. I've been on both sides. I've been on the policing side, and obviously I've been now on breaking massive stories against organizations. One of the biggest things that organizations do is, is fail to hold their hand up. And by and large, most of these things haven't even happened on the watch of the individual that's talking. No. The CEO, the new person in charge, the, the bishop, whoever it is, it's happened years previously. Mm -hmm. What they should be doing is acknowledging we made a mistake, we got it wrong, we now need to address that problem. But they don't. They try to close ranks and stop it from happening. And I've seen that happen so many, so many times. It'll happen in the future. It happened with Peter Ball. It happened with a lot of other individuals within organisations. And I think that's tough. Yeah, Mark, I'm mindful of time, you know, we, I've, I've yeah. got 25 questions here, we're on question seven. Go on, crap it, yeah, I'll <laughs> make my answers quick, go. But it's so, it's so interesting and it's important stuff. Um, so I just want to kind of move on if we can. Um, well, let, let's, let's talk a little bit about Oscar Pistorius because this was a story that blew me away. I was, um, I watched it because it was live on Sky News, I think. And yeah. I watched pretty much every hour. We even went on holiday to Lanzarote and I was in trouble because I spent far too much time in the hotel room watching this incredible yeah. case unravel. And um, I, I just, I suppose I want to ask you, um, did, it, did it move you as it much as it moved other people, watch, actually being there and speaking to him? I just felt that uh, Reva, St uh, Reva was never... She was, a, you know, you talk about the, these people who were forgotten. She seemed to be the forgotten person in all this, and it seemed to be more about saving his bacon than, than anything else for, for a long time in the trial. I think what happened, the problem with the trial is it became a showpiece. It became a showpiece for South African uh, prosecutors. It, the two individuals, the defence and the prosecutor, particularly the prosecutor, uh, was... was was in his element you know it was a theatrical element for him and, and sadly that played out on television it's the only case that's ever been broadcast before or since there's no other case so that's it, it stands in its absolute uniqueness mm. i think that was a massive problem i think the issues in terms of him uh, was sadly portrayed inaccurately at times you know the press reported inaccurately, the South African media reported inaccurately some things, and therefore the whole story got twisted. And what got lost between this was two young people who were madly in love, who if they'd been in other circumstances in other countries would most probably still be alive. And I mentioned that because I think that is fundamentally what's at, what is at the center of this is, had firearm not been so easily available and so uh, readily accepted, in the country, then she wouldn't have been dead because he wouldn't have had the gun to be able to shoot into the toilet. No. I've met him. I mean, I, I suppose I'm in a unique position compared to almost everybody else because I've spent a lot of time with Oscar. You know, not only have I spent time with Oscar, but I've been and seen him in jail since a number of times. Um, and I would say that Oscar now is, is a friend. Now that's difficult for some people to accept because some people are absolutely adamant he is a murderer and a killer. Um, but I can only go on the basis of the evidence that I've heard and looking at all the evidence that's presented to me, both through him and through the, uh, through the court process and draw my own conclusion. And my own conclusion is that on that night, he got out the bed towards the closest side of where the toilet was. He didn't have to go round the bed. He instinctively picked up his gun and fired into the toilet when he heard those noises, not in any belief that uh, Reva was in the toilet. He'd only recently been in a, a relationship with Reva. He was still madly in love with her. There was no evidence of domestic violence in any way at all. Um, so I think it's an incredibly sad story. It's, it is, he, I mean, Oscar, it was very, is very religious. Oscar is a, is a really, deeply religious person. I've spent a lot of time with Oscar and we'd, he had a music, he had this, this uh, prayer that he would often say. He, he listened to a certain type of music before he ran. Uh, he, he would often um, uh, equate a lot of things to the Bible and how things were in there. 
So yeah, he was. He was a very religious person. Remains a very religious person in jail. Yeah. Can I? Yes. Uh, uh, just this week, Mark, I interviewed um, a lady in America uh, called uh, Morgan, who's not particularly famous, but she uh, had a drug addiction problem, and she. The, to cut a long story short, she she gave her boyfriend drugs which killed him, and she was sentenced to twenty years in prison served five and has been released. And, uh, but I, I can tell by interviewing her that that sits very heavy on her shoulders. So how does that sit with Oscar now? Is he, is he, is he making steps forward to change his life for the positive or is it, what, what kind of place is he in at the moment? So, I mean, Oscar is very clearly right from the very beginning and his position hasn't changed is that he, he of course, lives with what he has done every day you know i've spoken to him many times and even now he cries he gets very upset about that around certain dates he acknowledges he's taken reva's life and he's taken reva from his from her family so it is an incredibly sad thing i think in terms of trying to put his life back together again he hasn't got a date for release yet he doesn't know when that will be he's hoping to try and continue as much as he can and when he does get released try and repay some of that back to society and the communities that uh, you know that, that that he can work with he's a he's a very deep thinking individual he's incredibly sorry for what's happened he can't change the time he knows that if he had the chance he'd do it all again and obviously do it very differently and i do think there is a there's absolutely, he killed Reva. There's no doubt about that. The question is, is did he deliberately do it? And I say that there is no evidence to support that. And in fact, Judge Masipa in the first trial accepted that. And it was only on the technicality, really, that he ended up being convicted of murder. But there is a question in terms of punitive or restorative. You know, does, does everybody deserve the full length of a punitive sentence? Or is there an element where restorative justice comes into that? And, you know, one of those cases, which is really fascinating, I don't know if you've ever looked at it, was the Ealing Vicarage Rapist. So this is, a, this is, this is a, as it is, it's a vicarage. So a young girl is in her home with her mum and dad, her dad's a vicar, offenders come into the address, I think there's four or five, and tie them up and rape her effectively in front of her parents. Horrific, horrific. And on my sex offences course, she came in to talk to us. And one of the questions that I asked her was do you forgive those people that have done it what's your view about them now you hate them and she said no she said I've met one of them and I and I forget I, I have forgiven them for what they've done and you know and, and I've accepted that that happened in those times I think it's one of those things as a as a as an offender or as, as a victim we have to take a very clear view uh, about what the impact is on you you know I I often say to people hate is a really damaging thing it eats away at you i don't hate anybody i dislike people but i don't hate anybody because i think that then becomes it starts to eat away at you and i think as a victim you have to take a choice and go you know can i forgive that person or can i not and i think i would struggle i think i hugely struggle but some people can manage that and i think that's much says much more about them as a person being able to try and manage and move forward yeah, I think that's really interesting, and we're, and we're touching on some some deep theological stuff here. Because uh, one one of the questions that I was going to ask you was about your take on redemption, and 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 as a Christian minister, it's um it's one of the toughest nuts to crack with individuals who've um you know it's quite easy to forgive a trivial crime. You know, I don't know uh, somebody nicking some sweets off you or something, but but this concept of forgiveness when somebody has in, has impacted somebody's life so badly, where it's been rape or it's been paedophilia or if it's been murder mm. um so you know i just wonder what your take is you know um so somebody who has committed a murder and i'm sure you've seen many people convicted and this idea of redemption uh, you know should should life mean life or should people get a chance to redeem themselves i think i mean it's entirely dependent on the crime that they committed the age of which they committed those crimes and the manner in which those crimes were committed and what their thought process is now. You know, people change, people can change. Now that doesn't mean to say they change and they're a nice person, there will always be a risk. You know, if you've committed a sexual offense against someone, you'll always be a risk. 
if you've committed a murder, there will always be a, a propensity that that might happen again. But I do believe with safeguards in place, with certain crimes, we should look at a restorative element of it. I'm not a person, unless there is, and there are some that absolutely deserve to be locked away because they're a danger. I think our criminal justice system is an absolute mess because what I would be doing is releasing a lot of these people that are in jail. And I would be putting them through, not only through a restorative justice, but I would be putting them through some kind of community sentence. Yeah, you know, I want to see those people who have committed crimes against people to be paying something back to society. I'd put them in an orange jacket and I'd put them on roundabouts. I'd have them fixing fences that are broken down. I'd do all of that process because I think there is a value in terms of, of some punitive element for what you've done, but also enabling them to integrate back into society, but in a position to say, you know, if you, suffer, if you do this, there are consequences for this. Yeah. At this present moment in time, prison offers very little um, punishment to people because actually your time in punishment, the time in prison is in most prisons quite a, a nice time. You get a television, you get everything, you get fed, you get all of this aspect of it. And I think we should just be keeping those in prison who are genuinely a risk to, to, to people yeah. and those that aren't a risk, let's remove them, put into community basis. I mean, this what we forget often and I did a podcast recently, which is called The Detective, which focuses on a, what I believe is potential miscarriage of justice. And what we often forget about in the police service, and I think as a society, is that the impact of crimes on loved ones. So if, you're, if you are a murderer, or you're a sex offender and you go to jail, yeah, you've committed your crime, but what is the impact on your family? Yeah. And I think very often as police officers, we forget that, you know, they, they can't be held responsible for what their son's done, what their daughter's done. We still have to treat them with respect. And there was a case where this young girl was arrested for murder. She was then charged with murder. And the first that the family found out that she was being charged with murder was when they saw it on the news. Now, I think that's unacceptable. I think that's absolutely unacceptable. And I think we as police officers have a duty to inform people about things. We might not like them as a family, we might not like what their child's done, but I do think we have a, have a, a level of, of responsibility to people to yeah. just treat them with a little bit of respect. Yeah, I find that very refreshing to hear actually. And, and you know, it is something I, I often worry about the victim, that not, not the perpetrator of the victim, but the, the victim, the victims of the perpetrator really, and, and include mm. it, you know, um, just just quickly, just want to ask about, you know, I, I've seen uh, some of my friends have been in prison and have had uh, problems with addiction and they put their recovery purely down to a, a kind of a spiritual redemption. Do you see the value in, in that as well, Mark? You know, that um, you often yeah, see I think it, criminals yeah, turn into I mean, faith, don't you? I think there's obviously very different elements to it. And you take, you take um, Peter Sutcliffe, but Peter Sutcliffe uh, declared that he was a Jehovah's Witness and the Jehovah's Witness has changed him in terms of his behavior and approach to things. There are other people who have changed religions or have adopted a religion and taken it on board. I, I think anything is, if you can see a value and it changes your perspective, your, your view on life and what you've done and makes you a better person, then that's great. And I don't care what that is, whether that's the Church of England or whether it's some kind of small little, you know, the, the orange man brigade, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. If it makes you look at what you've done, value that and change how you are for the future and how it impacts on other people. The problem is, and this is where a massive problem, is that far too often people have used religion as an excuse for, or, or as a way of suggesting that they're good people. And the problem is, is that's not the case. I don't care whether you are a Christian or what, you're still capable of committing crimes. And actually, if you look at why wars take place, it is so often around religion that is a basis of so many wars in this country, so many things that have gone wrong. And so I think we, I, I'm for everybody that finds something that gives them some hope, and hope is really important. You know, if you go to jail for a period of time and you have no hope, what's the point? We have to live with hope. You live with hope. You, you, you want, you, you're living with expectations that tomorrow or the day after, you know, your children grow up, you're gonna do this, you're gonna see them this, happy and this. 
we have to live with hope. That's what gives us the desire to keep going. But what we also have to do is acknowledge that what we do impacts on other people. And, and it's not just criminals, I think as a society, how many people actually bother to think that what I'm saying, what I'm doing might upset somebody else yeah. and think about it before they do it. Because social media, the internet, you know, I've had horrific stuff said about me. You know, years ago, my daughter came home from school really upset and the teacher phoned up my home and said, you know, she's really upset that she'd seen on the internet, you know, dad being hung. And there's some horrific stuff and social media hasn't helped with that. And I'm sure people within your congregation and things are, are suffering those types of impacts. Bullying absolutely, is a absolutely. Problem. And some of, some of my clergy friends, you know, I mean, uh, mud sticks, doesn't it? You know, I'm not naive enough to sit here to say, well, there's a priest. He must be a, a pervy, pervy paedophile. And it, it breaks my heart to see that. And um, hopefully these kind of conversations help break some of that down and, and we should we should be ashamed of some of the things that we've done but we should also be you know uh, the church does many good things as well and um, we shouldn't be afraid to shout those things out and um, mark this has been really great I, I can't let you go without talking about one of our favorite programs at the moment which is hunted and you're in yeah you're in oh god i love that show i mean if you get me on that mark oh no that is just i love it i love it what What's your role in that show, Mark? So, I, so I've so i watched Hunted a lot and I've obviously never been involved in it. And then I got approached and said, you know, would you come on board as one of the, you know, one of the, key, one of the key's top staff? And I said, no. And then they said, no, seriously, would you? And I went, let me see how it fits into all my other schedules. Uh, and there was a space and I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I came on board as head of special operations in this basically role of, of catching the people. And, and I loved it. I mean, it was, it was fun. It was different. I mean, it is very, you know, I'm very much a, uh, an individual that's out and about and go and do it. You know, I, I track people down, I find them, I go and confront them. Um, and, and so I kind of struggled massively being constrained within the office. You know, ideally, I wanted to be out on the ground and go and catch these mm. people. Uh, but also, you know, I'm very used to running operations, so used to getting people, teams to go into certain places and do it. But it is fun. I think it's fun. I think the people involved in it are fun. I think that it's a, it's got a great audience now. Um, and yeah, I think it will, I think it was recommissioned again, wasn't it? I mean, I, I, my schedule now prevents me from doing anything at the moment. Oh, I, well, I was going to ask you is if we got more on the way, but. Uh, yeah, no, my schedule at the moment, it was a, it was a period of time, you know, maybe 12 months ahead, maybe mm. not this year, the year after, but I have said to them, you know, I quite fancy coming back and being the hunted, <laughs> um, but I'm not sure that will happen because I think that I did say to them, do you realize if I'm the hunted, you won't catch me? <laughs> you believe that as well? Uh, they won't catch me. There's no <laughs> way they catch me. I know, I know all the tricks. I know everything. There's no way they will catch me. I get that. I get the, the money for charity. No problems at all. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Mark, well, it sounds like you've got a really hectic schedule and I'm just very grateful that you managed to fit us in and uh, it's been absolutely fascinating. I could talk to you all afternoon, but uh, um, I'm just going to say thank you so much, Mark, for your time and uh, we wish you very well. We send our very best wishes from Burnley. Have you ever been to Burnley, Mark? Burnley, yes, I have been to Burnley, although I haven't been to Burn I, Burnley. I think I've gone through Burnley on the job. Uh, um, and I, so I haven't actually done much in Burnley. Oh, but, well. Yeah, I mean, you've got a good football club there, haven't you? We have, yes. It's yeah, Alistair Campbell, place, Campbell's it? football club, isn't it? Isn't it Alistair Campbell's football club? Isn't yeah, yeah, mad we'll about that. yeah, yeah. We've got much more going on than Alistair Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, thank you so much and uh, <laughs> goodbye. Take care. Bye-bye.